Whether it's ancient combat or modern sport, winning is what it's all about. But how do you win? This man has learned the hard way. Now, he's ready to show you. We've all heard of the Musketeers, the courageous cavaliers of countless movies. They lived by a code of chivalry, fighting gallantly for the honor of their king. The old medieval knights with their axes and maces were swept aside by regiments of musketeers. But the most feared weapon of the musketeers was this. In the right hands, the sword was powerful, accurate, and deadly. The swords of the musketeers, next on Conquest. First, we've gathered our combat team to learn how they fought in the golden age of Hollywood. Look at this. 1950s Cyrano de Bergerac, one of the greatest swordplay movies of all time. Starring Jose Ferrer, he got an Academy Award for it. Great screen fencer. The film provides inspiration for the team as they develop the dueling techniques of the movie Musketeer. First thing to do is to take a sword, and I want you to try some uh, Hollywood fencing moves. Now, the most important thing about Hollywood is that it doesn't matter what it looks like as long as it looks good. We all know what sword fights look like in the old movies. No one gets hurt, and the sword play can go on until someone yells, Cut! Well, it was nothing like this for the real musketeers, but we'll get to that later. So where did Hollywood's actors get the idea to fight like this? Once the film industry got started in Hollywood, screenwriters adapted classic tales of European literature, like Three Musketeers, Cyrano de Bergerac, Scaramouche, and California's very own Zorro. Now, all of these tales involved sword fights, so the fencing master came to Hollywood. The producers wanted fast, fancy fights. They had no interest in historical accuracy at all. There were two basic styles. The first used a saber or a light broadsword in a hacking, slashing style. But the universal Hollywood weapon used by the musketeers and everyone else was this. The cup hilt epee. Of course, this sword never really existed in history, but who cares? You could use it for cuts and slashes as well as fancy thrusts and lunges. It was strong and light and... It looked great. The team keep working on Hollywood-style fighting, and it's time for me to adopt the costume of a 16th-century musketeer. Ha! All right, guys, gather around. What do you think? Does it do it for you? All right, well, you've had a chance to try these swords out. Now we want to put together some routines from old Hollywood. All right, but first, we need to change you into the correct dress. OK, now you're all wearing these totally ridiculous clothes. You have my full permission to go completely over the top. As indeed they did in those old movies. Now that they've practised on their own, the team is ready to learn some full-length Hollywood fight routines. All right, guys, gather round, gather round. A lot of the fighters and the fight directors in those days were extremely good. Often they had a very short time to get their fights together. So they needed some routines that everyone understood and that everyone knew. For instance, I have a routine which I call the Flynn, after Errol, obviously, which is absolutely straightforward. It's simply a cut here and a cut there and a cut there and there. And then we go into the low line. There, 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 there. Now you go do it back to me. And one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And you can do that for about 20 minutes and it's not too exhausting, all right? Now, the next one, for instance, is called a box. In this one, I simply box in my opponent with a thrust to that shoulder and that shoulder. Now the hip, hip, there. OK, do the same back to me with cuts. Here we go. High, high, low, low, all right? And here's another section that I call the repostes, which is simply my thrust to your shoulder, come back to my shoulder, I come back to yours, you come back to mine, I bind you under, I come to the other shoulder, you come to my shoulder, there, there. They're absolutely simple, but it looks good, especially in close-ups. Let's just speed it up a little, and one, two, three, four, bind down, or one, two, three, four. The team is getting the thrust of swordplay for the movies. Adrian and Marlon go first. Very good, very good. I like the hat throw and I like the kick in the ass. Chris and Doug demonstrate with an aggressive looking fight that involves simply moving around an invisible circle. 
This is excellent, guys. I like the jumps very much. This is this is all very nice indeed. Listen, why don't you start your section right in here, okay? Get right back behind this piece of parapet here. All right, so your first five strokes will be this. Coming out here. Yep, so you're moving around. All right, just try that. Action! In a real sword fight, the point was to kill your opponent as swiftly as possible. But in Hollywood, the fighter's goal is to survive until their next take. Yeah! Tim and Al, both skilled fencers, put together a fight using some classic moves. It's very nice. It's great moves, guys. You know what the problem is? You're being too modest. Uh, All right? Uh, <laughs> now, with, in Hollywood, you absolutely had to let it rip. So exactly those strokes make them much, much bigger. And also, you've got this great parapet back here, so... You want to use it. On the other side of the courtyard, John and Justine have prepared the kind of duel that can bring a man to his knees. Excellent. And you're in the classic Hollywood clinch now, all right? At this point, you would say something like, um, you're my kind of girl, and you'd probably kick him. All right, so let's do that again. You're my kind of girl. Don't worry, it's nothing he uses. Now that we've perfected that and the other techniques, you guys can now use all the routines that we've gone through, put them all together in a single fight, which will be the Three Musketeers against the Cardinal's Guard and involving a Scarlet Woman. The storyline of most movie fights from old Hollywood had to be pretty simple. An innocent girl, our heroes, the Musketeers, a bunch of bad guys, and in this scene, a girl with a sword. The actual sword play was a combination of realistic fencing moves that look accurate and totally fanciful moves that, well, just look good. Jumps were particularly popular. Fancy blade work is often combined with good old rough and tumble. Whether they were actors or stuntmen, male or female, the fencers needed to be really good. Only with great control of the blade can you succeed with effects like this. It's not realistic, but it looks great. And you have to throw in some surprises too. Make the girl better than the guy. Hit him where it hurts. And finish him off with a flourish. A skilled fight director will give his actor fencing moves that reflects his character. And in the case of a bad guy, a certain death. Most old Hollywood fights combined serious swordplay with some pretty corny comedy. Even slapstick. In the end, it was glamorous, glorious, and jolly good Hollywood fun. We've all had a blast recreating Hollywood, and it is all a magnificent lie. Of all the moves we've learned so far, absolutely none of them were of any use at all to a real musketeer. Our image of 17th century swordplay has been created by the movies, and before that, by the romantic writers like Rostand, who created Cyrano de Bergerac, and Dumas, who created the Three Musketeers. Except they didn't, really. I mean, create them, that is. Cyrano de Bergerac was a real person. And amazingly, nearly every major character in Three Musketeers actually existed. The question is, what exactly was a musketeer? The original musketeers were regiments of infantry who were armed with the musket. At first a slow and inaccurate weapon that became increasingly powerful on the battlefield. But the king's musketeers were an elite force, the royal bodyguard, a regiment of gentlemen who would never dream of using a firearm. So, when Hollywood portrays a musketeer, he is armed, quite rightly, only with a sword. When it came to protecting the honor of one's king, the sword was mightier than the musket. The sort of weapon that they used then, and which you will have to learn to use now, is this. 
the rapier. There's a whole table full of rapiers here. I want you to go over there, choose one, come and try it out. The rapier evolved from a broadsword used by medieval knights. The old armoured glove was replaced by bars over the hilt that protected the hand. The rapier's slender form allowed a musketeer to concentrate all the power into the point. You can really tell the difference in the balance of this. The Hollywood ones we were using would hurt, but, but these feel like they'd, they'd really do a lot of damage. It's much more unwieldy, not as comfortable and as light as the other blades we were using. Sharp and heavy and nasty. Nasty longer blade. It's all right to attack with. You can really get in there, but it takes your weight with it, so it'd be hard to get back from the attack to defend with. In the right hands, the rapier could be a formidable instrument of death. It was a heavy and cumbersome sword whose razor-sharp point was intended mostly for attacking. And the people who use them would have to be pretty strong. This is, without doubt, the deadliest weapon that has ever been created for personal combat, simply because it is razor-sharp. It's the point that kills. Three inches of this will kill you. I could hack at you, I could hit your arms, I could hit your legs, you'd still live through it if you were lucky. If I stick you with one of these, you're dead. So virtually all of true rapier work is point work. The other thing is that these weapons were extremely long. Yeah? Just think of how quickly you can do a thrust. Don't move. Back! Okay? It's a split second. Stay where you are. Any thrust, you can get two, three thrusts in in a second. For defense, a musketeer might use his glove to grab at his opponent's rapier and immobilize it. If he had a cloak, that too could be used for protection. But a well-armed duelist would be armed with something more. All right, now this is a very small shield called a buckler. And this is pretty good, because if you use this in the left hand and hold it well out, it means that virtually your whole body is covered. But the buckler became dead weight if the fighting got too close. The ideal complement to the rapier was the left-hand dagger. All right, this is an ideal weapon, because with a very slight movement, very slight movements, you can parry it. Okay, give me a high thrust. There. You can knock the blade out of the way. Low thrust. There. Okay, another low thrust. There. Whatever you do with this weapon, it's short and sweet, all right? You can just about keep up with an incoming rapier with this weapon. And of course, give me another low thrust. If you get in, it means that the dagger can actually be used as an offensive weapon as well. But the most direct path to killing one's opponent with a rapier was with a move called the lunge. How many feet between us, do you think? 15. 15 feet, maybe. OK. Now watch this. This is a single lunge. Ah. All right, I'm a foot away from him. So basically, I've covered 12 to 14 feet with a single lunge. Among the most formidable moves is the time stroke. It allows me to deflect my opponent's lunge while simultaneously thrusting my rapier towards his stomach. Still, most damage with a rapier was inflicted with only a small movement. For instance, this one, come again. Yeah, I've just nicked to his face. All right, they often use the face as a target. If I hit him anywhere, keep still, anywhere above the eye, He's going to bleed and the blood will go straight down into his eye. He won't be able to see. If I hit him anywhere on the cheek, it's extremely aggravating and annoying. And it also means that he's going to be scarred for life and he knows it instantly. All right? If I manage to actually penetrate in any way the head, then he's gone. He's had it. Before the team take up their rapiers and go on guard against each other, they must be warned. Even as you're rehearsing, I want you to be aware, although we blunted these points, if this hits you, it will go in, all right? So I want you to keep your distance, keep your brain about you. You really can't fake these rehearsals. You have to be absolutely concentrated. The team has learned that a 17th century musketeer could be a deadly adversary in combat. That was due in part to the elegant design of his sword but without proper training, the sword was useless. 
So how did the musketeers of the day learn to become expert fighters, even heroes? All right, guys, gather around. Now, you are doing exactly what they would be spending most of their days doing. You're practicing with your rapiers and daggers. They had a lot of time to spend doing exactly this. And they started to hire the new specialists, the new fencing masters. Now, these guys were great salesmen, apart from being good fencers, and they all published these incredibly articulate and ornate manuals, like this one. The manuals were illustrated with every pose and position a swordsman was likely to encounter. More than just a rule book for slicing and dicing one's opponent, such manuals showed a musketeer how to mould his body into a weapon. But Look, how realistic lost, were they? Could you really learn sword fighting from a book? This example shows the swordsman fighting with only a rapier, no shield and no dagger. Chris, I noticed that you were actually trying to fight Marlon with just rapier and no dagger. How did you find it? I just felt every time I made an attack, I just left myself wide open because he could parry with one and I had nothing to make the block with. Chris has a point. Sense, I mean, I'd rather fight with two swords instead of one. Yet these were among the teachings and strategies of the greatest fencing masters of the 17th century, a time when stuff like this could save your life. The best musketeers didn't just study fencing moves. They learned how to use the whole body as a weapon, a fighting machine that could focus all its power into one point. So far, the team has used real swords to practice their moves. They've been unable to make actual body contact because of the danger posed by the sharp points of the rapiers. To practice actual hits on the body, the musketeers would have used wooden swords and daggers. All right, guys, this is exactly how they would have practiced, with um, wooden rapiers and daggers. OK, you take that. So come on guard. I don't want any hits or even any attempts of, of hits towards the face, OK? Such wooden weapons spared the fences from accidental death or injury. There is no better way to learn from your mistakes than being hit in the guts with a wooden sword. Very nice, very nice. Knowing that the next time it might be razor-sharp steel. I have to admit to you, I've never done this before myself, so I want to go. All right. <laughs> Besides, you're tired, so I'm more likely to win. <laughs> Got me. I overcommitted myself. Good. Lucky for me, I'm dueling with serious? safe weapons, or I'd surely be bleeding right now. I'm looking right at your eyes. <laughs> In our quest to find the true spirit of the musketeer, our team has learned that there are two kinds, the Hollywood version and the real thing. First, the team learned the sword-fighting techniques of Hollywood, moves that looked good, but would get you killed if you were challenged by a true swordsman. Using a fencing manual from the 17th century, they learned the time-honored fighting stances or guard positions of the musketeers. Some of these moves and positions may have been experimental. They look extraordinary to us. But other moves were practical and deadly. Next, they learned that the body and sword could be used together as a machine fine-tuned for killing. Now comes the time for our team to demonstrate all they have learned in a real fight. The wooden swords are gone. They have been replaced by true rapiers in the Spanish and Italian style. These were the types used by the original musketeers. Although the team will not willingly inflict injury during this demonstration, it is nonetheless a possibility. When they receive a blow that would have inflicted a mortal wound in combat, they will lay down their arms and drop to the ground. These ground rules allow us to see that such wounds, and even death, could come quickly in a real standoff between seasoned musketeers 
men who were armed with the finest equipment and trained to waste no time as they lunge, parry and riposte. Such battles were fought for truth and honour by the most glamorous and elite regiment in the King's army. Their duels are the stuff of legend. Their lives and deaths still captivate us more than 300 years after the last of the musketeers died fighting. One for all, and all for one. So is that how the musketeers really fought? Well, perhaps it's as close as we can ever get. And we've had great fun recreating how to win as a Hollywood swashbuckler. And we've mastered some of the ways of the real musketeers. But with a sharp rapier in your hand, how many of these classroom techniques would have really worked? Well, I'm very glad that I will never have to find out.